Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, I don't have any updates about the final project or weekly reports. Everything going well? Any tips or tricks I can help you with? No? Okay, so uh, we're going to dive back in to lecture material uh, in a moment, but before we do, um, one of the many perks of being a professor is every once in a while I get to embarrass my students. Today is one of those days. Your uh, student peer here, Cam Bielowski, uh, I think has discovered something pretty interesting in the last few days. He pulled an all-nighter last night trying to get this submitted to a conference. I, I went to bed at midnight. <laughs> went to bed at midnight, not an all-nighter. Okay, not quite. We don't have time to talk about this figure. I think it's super cool. It's not about robotics, but it's related to many of the things we've talked about in this class. If you're interested, talk to Cam. Well done, Cam. Okay, all right, back to robotics. All right, we are uh, working through our short segment on uh, collective intelligence in robotics. As in nature, there are many tasks uh, that confront organisms that are difficult or impossible for an individual to do on their own, but if they can figure out how to coordinate, and in some cases explicitly communicate, they're able to do something together that's beyond the ability of any one of them. So as roboticists, that leaves us with the research question, how? How exactly do you design, or in our case, evolve autonomous machines to autonomously coordinate their actions to do something that's beyond the ability of any one of them? We saw arguably where these ideas started to take root back in the 1980s when we looked at some of the work from Craig Reynolds and his Boyd's uh, algorithm where there is no one leader. We have a large number of independent agents and they are uh, active, they are working collectively by running basically the same program. All of them are running the same program which is a combination of these three functions which continuously updates the operations uh, of each individual. We ended last time by looking at uh, another study from about 10 years later, uh, and this is arguably an evolutionary robotics experiment, but again, pre-physics engine era, no real physics engine here. We have a very, very simple two-dimensional plane that's been uh, curved so that the two long ends touch, and then that tube is curved so that the two ends of the tube connect. So we have a toroid and we have four virtual lions that are gonna be running around the surface of this toroid and a gazelle that is gonna be trying to escape from them on this infinite toroid. None of the five can fall off because the toroid has no edges. So far, so good. Uh, as usual, we're going to see an evolutionary algorithm that's going to evolve behaviors for the four lions, and you can probably guess what the fitness function is going to be. The fitness function is going to reward for minimal distance between any one of the lions and the gazelle at the end of the simulation. That's a single floating point number, a distance between the closest lion and the gazelle. And that number, that fitness, is not assigned to any one lion. That fitness value is going to be assigned to all four lions, even those lions that were nowhere near the gazelle when the, li the li closest lion actually did bring down the gazelle. So this is something we haven't seen so far before. In all of this course so far, we've seen selection acting on individuals, selection being Darwinian selection. What we're going to see in this work today is a form of group selection where evolution is favoring or not favoring, not an individual, but a group. This is a very controversial subject in evolutionary biology. Might have come up in a biology class you've taken. Why is group selection such a controversial topic? Any ideas? Good question. So 
Is that the level that selection works on it, or is the group the appropriate target of selection? It seems obvious, well, obvious to many of us, when you hear about Darwinian evolution, it makes sense. Things that I do well or poorly affects whether or not I survive long enough to actually reproduce offspring. And assuming those individuals, my offspring, inherit my pros and cons, they're likely to, to uh, inherit the same kind of selection pressures. So it seems obvious, but what exactly is it about me I, I don't act alone. I have brothers and sisters and cousins and parents and grandparents and friends and foes and so on, which also influence whether or not I live long enough and survive long enough to produce offspring. So is it just me that's the target of selection? Is it myself and my siblings, myself and my siblings and my cousins, myself, my siblings, my cousins, my friends, everybody else? What exactly is the target of selection? You can also look inward. Is it all of me that is the target of selection? Arguably, for many of us, there's just one cell in our body that actually goes on to become our offspring. The rest is temporary. So is all of this the target of the selection, or is it just our gametes? Where exactly does the pressure of Darwinian selection uh, come to bear? It's a controversial topic. It's beyond the scope uh, of this class. But again, for those of you that are interested in the biological aspects of what we're talking about, it's interesting to read up on group selection. One particular form of group selection that is not so controversial is kin selection. If my siblings do not have children, but they help me raise my child, my siblings benefit from an evolutionary point of view, even though they're not producing offspring. Feels like a bit of a catch-22. If you don't produce offspring, how are you possibly benefiting from an evolutionary point of view? Because you still share some of the same amount of genetic material. Absolutely, right? So a sibling that doesn't have offspring of their own, but helps raise the, the offspring of their siblings, benefits evolutionarily because they're helping half of their genes, for most species it's half of their genes, propagate into the next generation. So not so controversial, but again brings us back to the target of selection. So maybe the sibling wasn't actually the target of selection to begin with. Maybe it's just the genes that make up the sibling that is actually the target of selection. It doesn't matter whether I survive or my siblings survive as long as our genes collectively survive. So maybe we shouldn't be thinking about the individual as the target of selection. We should be thinking about genes as the target of selection. Gets, gets tricky sometimes. This idea of genes actually being the real targets of selection and not individuals is known as the selfish gene Hypothesis, you've probably heard of this before. Richard Dawkins was the originator of this idea, also very controversial. Today, what we're going to look at, or what we've been looking at in this course so far, is sort of the traditional view of selection. The individual organism or the individual robot produces offspring in proportion to how well it survives and does whatever it is we want it to do. What we're going to be looking at today is kin selection. As you're going to see in a moment, these lions share genetic material and they all benefit collectively or fail to benefit collectively, not based on how well any one individual in the, in the group does, but how well they do together, in this case, in bringing down the gazelle. So far, so good? Okay, all right, so uh, let's talk a little bit now about the evolutionary side of this. As I just mentioned, we're gonna evolve behavior for the pride of lions. We are not gonna be evolving uh, behavior for the gazelle. We're gonna fix the behavior of the gazelle. One more uh, biology uh, side note I want to make is if we were evolving the behavior of the gazelle, we'd be considering co-evolution. 
Obviously, as predators evolve to be better at what they're supposed to be doing, the general fitness of all of the prey starts to go down. The chance of producing offspring becomes less for the prey. There is strong selection pressure acting on the prey to evolve uh, escape behaviors of the predators. If they do, if the prey start to increase in fitness, they get better and better at uh, avoiding the predators. What happens to the general fitness of the predator population? Down. This, this is coevolution, right? Your fitness, you as an individual of a group, is no longer dependent on just what you or your group does, but now also on what other groups are doing. You might remember back to the beginning of the course when we introduced this idea of the fitness landscape. So as a population is uh, experiencing genetic change over evolution, that cloud of points is moving horizontally in the fitness landscape. And if the fitness of those individuals is generally going up, that's them climbing a slope in their fitness landscape. The fitness landscape is sort of this metaphorical, mathematical landscape that helps us visualize or think about evolution. In a coevolutionary process, we no longer have a fitness landscape because the height of peaks or the depths of troughs do not stay constant over time. As the fitness of predators goes up, the fitness of prey goes down. As the fitness of prey goes up, the fitness of predators goes down, and you have a fitness C now. You have waves that are going up and down. That's coevolution. There are coevolutionary robotics experiments in which we have two sets of evolving populations competing against one another. We'll see this in about uh, towards the end of the course in about two weeks from now. Today, we're not looking at coevolution. We're looking at a version of kin selection. <laughs> The behaviors of the lions are going to evolve. We're going to fix the behavior of the gazelle. Didn't there be coevolution with the coevolution of gorilla and the simulator to the spikes? Uh, good question. Didn't we see coevolution already when we were seeing coevolution of the simulators and the and the robot behaviors? Yes, yes, you're right. In a way, in a way, that's a form of coevolution. We have a population of simulations and a population of controllers. It's kind of coevolution. We're going to see a cleaner, more obvious version of this in two weeks, when there's two populations of robots competing against one another. OK. OK. All right. Oh, I already mentioned this. So the savanna is toroidal. But obviously, I'm not going to draw this as toroid. We're going to look at two-dimensional uh, we're going to look at two-dimensional images. Okay, let's talk about the behavior of the gazelle first. This is fixed. This, this is the behavior of the gazelle. B is a, is, stands for behavior. It's a two, it's a vector of length two. This length two vector dictates how the x and y coordinates of the gazelle is going to change from the current time, time t, to its new position at t, t plus 1. So you can think of b as an arrow that is pointing out of the gazelle at time t, and it's pointing in the direction in which the gazelle is about to move at the next time step. OK, so what is, how do we compute this vector for the gazelle at each time step? It's a sum over a whole bunch of vectors that are taken from a set of vectors, and these vectors are the vectors that connect the gazelle to each lion. So we're going to sum up over four vectors. We're going to sum these four vectors together and use that to compute the new uh, heading of the gazelle. Why the minus sign in front of the summation symbol? Absolutely, right? Look where all the lions are in general. Take the average of all of those vectors and head in the opposite direction. Very simple, but probably a pretty good thing to do. You'll notice that this is a weighted sum. Each time we add a vector to the sum, before we negate it, we divide by the length of that vector. Why? 
This is a slightly smarter thing for the gazelle to do. The gazelle could simply take the average of its uh, distances or, and, and directions from the lions and head in the opposite direction. It's not what the gazelle does. It takes the weighted sum. Why? Absolutely. So in my little cartoon visualization here, L1 is the closest lion, which means the magnitude of this vector is the least magnitude among these four magnitudes. So when we divide by that least magnitude, that magnifies the influence of this vector on the direction in which the gazelle moves. Everybody see that? Okay, so to sum up the math here, at every time step, the gazelle is going to sense all of the predators and react most strongly to the ones that are closer to it. Okay, let me just back up for, uh, leave that up there actually. There's one more uh, normalization term here, which is we're computing max here. Max what? What's W and H here, do you think? The max distance it could move. It's not the max distance it could move. Is there any sort of boundary conditions? Kind of. It's not the boundary conditions because there are no boundaries on the toroid in the toroid, but you're getting close. What does W and H stand for? Do you think? Under my height, width and height. It's the width and height of the rectangle before it's turned into a toroid. So it's a little confusing. We're dealing with the toroid. We take the width and height, and then we take the Pythagorean distance of the diagonal of half that. So here's here's half. W, half the width of this sheet, and here's half the height of the sheet, and here's max. This is the length of the diagonal. Max what? The fact that an I could be way off north here, the fact that the maximum distance for it could be the line, is that more than like Ver very close, the maximum distance, not that necessarily can see. It's the furthest it can possibly be away from the lion. It's the, it's the furthest the gazelle can possibly be from a lion on the toroid, right? It's hard to think about distances on a toroid. If we were to put the gazelle and the lion, forget four lions, just one lion, we put the gazelle and the lion at any two points on the toroid, how far can they possibly be from one another? It's this, it's max. So what we're actually doing, if you think about it in this cartoon, this cartoon is wrong. This is not the distance that connects the gazelle to L4. You can probably tell by I the length of this vector is longer than max. So that's not really, L4 is actually closer to the gazelle on the toroid than it looks from this vector here, yeah? It's actually probably something like up northwest of the gazelle and wrap around, and the L4 is actually quite close to the gazelle. So we're normalizing by this term based on distances on the toroid. Just, just a reminder that we're not dealing with a sheet, we're dealing with a toroid, but this is the most important thing for our purposes move away from the lions, and weight your decision based on who's closest. Doesn't that affect the length of the, um, what's it called, the, like the line? The length of the vector the that connects, the right, the length of the gazelle lion vector, let's say. Yeah, absolute, absolutely it does. So there's a little bit of normalization here, but for our purposes, just a reminder, we're dealing with the tori. So far so good? Okay, let's keep going. Okay, that's the gazelle, relatively straightforward. 
The behavior of the lions, not so straightforward. We'll spend a couple minutes on this slide. Uh, let's go to the title of this paper for a moment, Evolving Teamwork. So obviously we're going to be evolving teamwork for the lions and coordination <coughs> among the lions. They're going to actually, the lions are actually going to coordinate their behavior to try and bring down the gazelle using genetic programming. And we saw genetic programming way back at the beginning of the course when we were surveying different kinds of evolutionary algorithms. An evolutionary algorithm is the umbrella term. Evolutionary algorithms is the umbrella term for a whole bunch of different kinds of evolutionary algorithms. You've implemented a genetic algorithm in your, in your projects. Arguably, a parallel hill climber is a type of evolutionary algorithm. We talked briefly about genetic programming. That's distinct from other kinds of evolutionary algorithms for a particular reason. Anybody remember what made genetic programming distinct? The level that encodes the behavior of a function of what's built by a tree is a more particularly bad quality of operand in evolution. Absolutely, which is exactly what we're going to do here. So in, gene in genetic algorithms, like in your code, the data, structure, uh, the data structure that encodes the behavior of the robot or encodes the phenotype is usually a vector. In your case, it's a vector that encodes the synaptic weights for the neural network that drives the behavior of the robot. So the behavior of the robot is the phenotype, in the and the genotype is a vector of weights. In genetic programming, no matter what the phenotype is, the data structure for storing the DNA or the genotype is a tree. We're going to be using genetic programming. We're going to see genetic programming being used in this experiment. So if you were to look inside the heads of the, of the uh, lions, you wouldn't see vectors or neural networks. You would see trees. We're going to use trees to evolve the behavior of the lions. OK, what exactly do these trees look like. As you mentioned, we're going to start by building a random tree for each lion in each pride. We're going to be evolving populations of things. What are the things we're going to be evolving? We're going to be evolving behaviors for a pride, a pride of lions, and we're going to have a tree that encodes the behavior for each lion. So inside each of the four lions, there's going to be one of these trees. To start an evolutionary algorithm, we usually start with random genotypes. In your case, random vectors of floating point values. In our case, we need to start by creating a random tree. As you mentioned, I used this metaphor at the beginning of the class of having a bag of operators and operands, the things that you can use to build a tree the building blocks, if you like. This is the list of operators and operands that we can use to build the behaviors for our lions. The, oper the operands have zero arguments associated with them, and all of the operators here have more than zero arguments associated with them. So here's some familiar operators, plus and minus. Here's some slightly less obvious operators. We'll talk about these in a moment. So let's imagine we take these three operands, put them in our bag, and these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine operators, uh, operators also put them in the bag. We have a total of three things, three operands, nine operators. We shake up the bag. And then we reach into the bag and pull out one of these 12 things at random. And let's assume, by chance, I happen to pull out this operand called last. And I put that in the top of my empty tree. I, I happen to grab an operand rather than operator. That operand has zero arguments. So there's nothing that last needs to execute. It doesn't need any arguments. It's done. It's happy. So we're done building a tree. We just built a tree at random. It's a one-node tree. We take 
this one node tree and drop it into the head of lion one. We also drop it into the head of L2, drop it into the head of L3, and drop it into the head of L4. So far, so good? Okay. We take, we're gonna now simulate our swarm, our swarm of lions, our pride of lions. So we take G, the gazelle, and drop it at some random position on the toroid. Take each of the four lions that have this in their head and drop those four lions also at random positions on the toroid and start the simulation. We turn the simulation on. The gazelle looks at all the other lions and indicates that at the next time step it wants to move in direction B. So far, so good. What direction do all four lions want to move in? Each of the four lions at this first time step in the simulation execute this function. What do the lions want to do at the next time step? They want to go in the direction that they moved at the last time step, but it's time step zero. They don't have, they didn't move in a direction at the last time step. So on the first move of the first time step, this function returns a random vector. So all the lions move in a random direction. The gazelle moves away from them. And at the second time step of the simulation, the gazelle looks again at all the four lions and heads in the opposite direction. What do the four lions do? Emily? They, just keep, running in the same direction. they keep running in the direction that they ran, at, ran in at the mm -hmm. last time step. How do you think this particular pride of lions does at bringing down the gazelle? <laughs> Probably not very well, right? So whatever the, we're going to calculate the fitness at the end of the simulation. And I don't remember if they mention it. I think, they, I think they updated the simulation 15 times. I think there were 15 time steps in the simulation. So at the 15th time step, you can imagine that the distance between G and the closest L was quite large. We set the fitness of all four lions, or we set the fitness of this thing to one over that distance. The larger this distance, the lower the fitness of this lion pride behavior. So far, so good? Okay. We're running genetic programming, so we've just evaluated the fitness of the first uh, behavior for the pride of lions in the population. But remember, in an evolutionary algorithm, we're always evolving a population of things. So we go to the next tree, random tree in the population. We don't have that tree yet, so we've got to construct this second tree in the population at random. So we throw last back, in, back into the bag, we shake it up, and in this case, let's assume that we, by chance, happen to pull out the addition operator. The addition operator takes two arguments, so we need to now randomly construct the two arguments that are supplied to plus. Let's assume, uh, let's assume that I pull out rand now from the bag. And this one takes one argument, so I need to fill something in here. Let's say I pull out from the bag at random the gazelle operand, and over here I pull out the random direction, rand, dur, rand, dur, operand. I have a second random tree. I reset the position of G and the four lions. I drop them at five different random positions on the surface of the toroid, make four copies of this, and drop a copy of this into the heads of each of the four lions and then start the simulation again. What do the lions do in this case? We've got to evaluate this tree inside the head of the first of the four lions. It moves roughly in the 
gazelle? Roughly in the direction of the gazelle. All right, let's see. Let's visit gazelle down here. This is an operand that returns a vector from the lion to the gazelle. So I'm L1. I've got a particular vector that connects me to the gazelle. This node returns this vector. This vector gets supplied to this function. Random, this is a function that acts on vectors. All of the operators here are vector operations. Yeah? So this vector operation randomizes the magnitude of the original vector. So maybe rand makes this vector a little bit shorter by chance. Could have also made it longer. Same direction, but slightly different magnitude. This operand over here returns, as you would imagine, some random vector. And then this vector operation sums these two vectors, which actually gives a very, very small vector, looks like to me. Yeah? This, this is the direction that L1 moves in. We take this exact same tree and we now evaluate it for L2, the second lion. Does this identical tree that's in the head of the second lion, does it return exactly the same vector or a different vector? I see most of you shaking your heads no, right? This is different. Yeah, it's different for the different lions. So they're all running exactly the same strategy in their heads, but the lions can behave differently, not unlike what we saw with the boys, right? They're all running exactly the same program, but produce different behavior. So far, so good? Okay, let's say by chance we apply the exact same we apply, apply the exact same fitness function to this pride of lions and maybe they do a little bit better than this pride of lions this one was pretty poor maybe this one does a little bit better we evaluate the third tree or we evaluate the behavior of the third pride running the third tree we evaluate the behavior of the fourth pride uh, running the fourth random tree, and so on in our population of 100 random trees, which is 100 random behaviors for lion prides. What do you think we do as we move from this first generation of genetic programming to the next generation? Andrea, I have a question. Sure. I don't know if you're into this course. When you say like a random tree, do you, if you encounter like tree number three, Great question. So what happens by chance if there happens to be, by chance, this tree in the population as well? Does it get exactly the same fitness? Why not? We start, we start every simulation with different random initial conditions, which are the initial positions of the lion. So maybe not, but this is still a pretty crappy solution, so it's probably also going to be low, right? So even if we have identical genotypes in the population, we don't necessarily get identical phenotypes, which in this case is the behavior of the pride, and therefore these two genotypes do not necessarily get identical fitness values. Identical twins here in the real world don't necessarily always have the same number of offspring that are equally successful, right? Just because you get the same genetic roll of the dice doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have the same outcome in life. But assuming that your genome dictates more or less your chance, evolutionary chances uh, in this world, you're going to get similar values over, in general. So far, so good? Okay, all right, so we finished assigning a fitness value to every pride of lions, and we're gonna move on to generation two. How do we move from generation one to generation two? What do we need to do, which is what we've done in every evolutionary algorithm we've seen so far? I'm picking up my eraser, this is a strong hint. 
delete the ones that have low fitness and make randomly modified copies of the survivors. When we talked about genetic programming, what does randomly modified copies look like? If this is the child that I just produced from this parent, it's identical to the parent, we choose a node at random, we delete what's in there, we reach back into our bag of three operands and nine operators, shake it up, and pull something else out, like for example, uh, if dot product. This one is a little more complicated. It takes one, two, three, four arguments. I'm getting a little bit lazy here. So instead of putting actual operators and operands here, I'm just gonna put vector one, vector two, vector three, and vector four, because in this form of genetic programming, every node in every tree always returns a vector. Right? These are all vector operands and operations. So let's assume in my cartoon example here, these are the vectors that these four nodes return for one lion at one time step in the simulation. What does the dot product, what does this particular vector operation do? Evaluate the first and second arguments. Okay, we've done that. We've evaluated the first and second arguments. So we have two vectors in hand. If they're dot product, okay, pause, take the dot product between these two vectors. If the dot product of these two vectors is greater than or equal to zero, and let's assume in my cartoon example here that the dot product between these two vectors is greater than zero, then evaluate and return the third argument. So we take this vector and return it. If the dot product between these two vectors had been less than zero, then we return the vector returned by the fourth argument up to this node. Everybody see that? It's just another vector operation. Okay. All right. All right. So that's how we can construct and evolve behaviors for a pride of lions. It's hard to hold all this in your head. Let's try and construct from scratch a behavior for a single lion. You're the lion. You're very hungry. You're motivated to pick carefully from this set. What do you do? Not bad, right? You're really hungry. You don't have a lot of time to think. Head for the gazelle. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention a little detail here, which is going to be important for you as a hungry lion. The gazelle, at every point in time, travels three units, or three length units. It travels three length units in this direction. The lions, I hope it says it here. Oh yeah, the lions only travel one unit. Not unlike our actual lion, right? Gazelles in real life and on our virtual Serengeti travel faster than the lion. Chasing the, the gazelle seems like a good thing to do. The gazelle is overjoyed that you have chosen this strategy. It can easily evade you. This ain't gonna cut it. Other ideas? Okay. Not so easy, is it? It's a trick question. There, there is nothing really you can do. If you're, if you're on a perfectly infinite, perfectly flat plane, and your competitor can run three times as fast as you can, what can you possibly do, right? Not much. So the investigators in this case have kind of 
created a non-level playing field here, no pun intended, in favor of the gazelle if there's one lion. If there's four lions, suddenly there's more opportunity for the lion pride. Everybody see that? It's not clear what that opportunity is, but there probably is something that they can do as a group that's beyond the ability of any one lion. Okay. Let's have a look. They're going to, as we just said, they're going to run genetic programming and evolve these trees for four lions and see over evolutionary time how well does the lion prides, how well do the lion prides evolve to bring down the gazelle. That's experiment one or experiment A. We spent some time last week talking about A-B testing, creating two similar algorithms and then comparing how well they do. Consider this algorithm A. This is algorithm B. It looks and acts exactly like algorithm A. We're going to use genetic programming. We're going to encode the behaviors of lions as sets of vector operations. But we're going to throw four additional operands into the bag, the thing that we can construct the behaviors for lions. Let's have a look at them. One of these operands, remember they're all vector operands, is a vector that uh, starts at the lion nearest the gazelle and connects to the gazelle. So in this case, it's probably this vector that starts at L1 and points to the gazelle. The second one, uh, vector operand we're going to look at is that the, the lion pride is going to have available to it is a vector from the lion that's running this tree in its head, I'm lion I, that connects me to my nearest lion. So I have access to this vector. Our lion means right-hand lion. So I'm a lion and I'm heading in this direction, or I was heading in this direction at time t. I'm computing my new heading. I need a new vector at time t plus one. Our lion is going to return the vector that connects me to the lion that's immediately on my right. If I start doing a clockwise sweep from the direction in which I headed last, the first lion that I hit in my clockwise sweep, that's the lion that's immediately on my right. If I, if I hit this node in my behavior tree L lion, I do the same thing. I take the direction that I was heading in uh, last time step, and I start a counterclockwise sweep, and th this operand now returns a vector that connects me to the lion that's immediately on my left. Yeah? My left, my right, my distance to the gazelle. This is things from the lion's point of view. The lion that's running that's running this tree in its head. When I'm sensing the world and I'm interpreting my sensation relative to me, on my right, on my left, that's known as diictic sensing. When you're having a conversation with someone and you talk about the person that's on your left or your right, that's you communicating the results of you interpreting your sensation diictically. What's actually coming in is obviously just blobs of color and motion and light and dark. You interpret that as things out there in the world. And then as a last step, you may interpret those things out there in the world relative to yourself. We've actually seen this concept before. This idea of thinking or reasoning about objects and things and people out in the world relative to yourself. Where did we see this concept pop up before? The minimal cognition experiments, yes. What specifically in the minimal, what phenomenon in the minimal cognition experiments was it? What was the name for this thing about reasoning about how I relate to things in the world? Do you remember the one with the robot that can see its like, like the motion of its arm or uh, relate like that it, it, when it moves, the arm moves or whatever? Kind of, but not quite. Related to this concept that I'm fishing for. Affordances? Affordances, right? How do we know that a chair is a chair? 
in kindergarten, we're taught that a chair has four legs. This one doesn't. It's got five legs. Those have four legs. It's not really so much about the geometry of things out there in the world. It's how we relate to them. As these lions are pounding uh, along the virtual Serengeti plane, they are sensing, or they can sense, other things out there. They can sense G, the gazelle, and they can now sense my leftmost lion, my rightmost lion, things that are relative to themselves. This is deictic sensing. So in algorithm B, we're going to construct random trees, but we're now going to pull operands and operators out of a bag that contains not 12 items, but 13, 14, 15, 16 items. So the evolutionary algorithm has additional options. It can build or evolve behaviors for the pride that incorporate deictic sensing if it's helpful to the pride. If not, evolution is going to delete is going to delete trees that contain deictic sensing and evolution is going to quote unquote choose not to use it. It's not helpful. So in algorithm B, the investigators are in essence asking a research question. If we want to evolve collective behavior for robots, is it helpful for them, if they're doing something collectively, to, deter to determine what to do based on deictic sensing or not? Everybody see that so far? OK. That's variant B. Third and final uh, algorithm variant is variant C where they're going to take the base set, they're going to take the 12 items in the bag and throw in a 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th item and run genetic programming again. Evolve behaviors for the pride, exactly the same fitness function. Everything else is exactly the same. In this case, evolution has the option to construct behaviors for the lions using name-based sensing. Good question. Why is this any different from deictic sensing? Let's have a look at these four vector operands. As always, these new operands return a vector. In this case, L1 returns a vector that emanates from me, the current lion that's running this, to lion 1. Every time I move, that vector changes, like, most likely changes, because my position relative to L1 probably changes. Let's just check in with our intuition that we understand what's going on. Imagine all four lions are running this program. How does this pride of lions move? towards lions one and two. What happens if you are lion one or two? Go towards each other. Let's start with an even simpler one, this tree. Let's take this tree and drop it into the heads of all four lions and turn on the simulation. What is L1, what is actually lion one do when L1 runs this in its head? stays still, right? When L1 executes this program, it returns this vector. When any of the other three lions run this program, it returns the vector that connects them to L1. Everybody see that? OK, so back to Abby's question about what is the difference between name-based sensing and deictic sensing. Anybody have any ideas? If you're evolving behaviors for a lion pride using this stuff, what kinds of behaviors might you get compared to evolving behaviors for the lion pride using this stuff? Instead of deactic, it'd be like more like group thing. More like not one single leader, but just following everyone, but then the name base is like following the leader. Could be, could be. Getting close, right? Think about any team sports that you've ever played. 
what, depending on the sport, it matters, what sort of makes sense. Some sports, you rely on who's on your right, who's on your left, who's in your field of view, who can't you see, so you therefore know are behind you. That's all deictic sensing, right? Versus I'm paying attention to number 14. Or I'm basing what I do based on the person who's playing front forward. I'm not much of a sports person, so you have to forgive my sports references here, right? I'm going to pay attention to what the, go the other player's goalie is doing and not worry too much about what everyone else is doing. That's name-based sensing, maybe not name, but there's a specific player or individual in the team or on the other team that you're paying attention to. What different kinds of strategies does this give rise to? As you pointed out, one, one thing you tend to get in deictic sensing is similar behavior within the group, which means they're all kind of doing the same thing. Not necessarily executing exactly the same change in position at every time step, but doing generally the same thing. That's generally less true in name-based sensing. Their, their own set position that they play. And I, what I mean by the role within the team. Role within the team. Okay, now we've entered new territory in our, uh, in our study of collective intelligence. What is this phenomenon that we're talking about now? We've heard several different synonyms for it. Specialization. Specialization, division of labor, for various reasons, I'm the one that usually comes in and stands up here and does all the talking. It's not me one day and then you the next day. There are classes like that, but that's not this class, right? For certain, under certain circumstances, it makes sense for certain people to specialize to do certain things and others to do other things. When we're trying to do something as a group, like trying to keep the civilization running, some people teach, some people learn, and then those roles switch division of labor. If you look across the animal kingdom and you look at various species that attempt col uh, collective behavior, like us and many uh, insects, in some cases you do see division of labor, in some cases you don't. It gets complicated. Sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it doesn't. I haven't shown you the results of, ex of, of algorithm C, B, or A yet. What do you think? Do you think groupthink or sort of the starlings approach where there's sort of a cloud of similar behavior going on within the pride? Is that a good thing to do? Or does it make sense for some of the lions to specialize here? That's the question. So it, it's possible that evolution could evolve specialization among the lions. Do you think it makes sense in this task? Four lions running on the surface of a donut trying to bring down a gazelle. It does make sense because it's just like when there's a whole bunch of them fighting. So like if there's another one running by, it's like, hey, see, I guess it's just you know, the same lions would be there, like this group of lions would be there and vice versa. Could be, could be, right? Maybe it makes sense. It's not possible to hide on this toroid because there's no obstacles, but, but ambushing, sneaking up on, maybe, maybe. I don't know about you, but when I first came across this study, before I actually read the results, I wasn't, I wasn't sure. I, I put my money on the fact that this wasn't the way to do it. This wasn't sufficient. The lions didn't have enough information to coordinate behavior, but it wasn't clear to me whether these lions were going to evolve to be better at collective hunting than these lions. Let's see. Okay. Before we look at results, there's one other wrinkle in this experiment we need to deal with, which comes back to this issue about group fitness. As I mentioned, you know, within, this popula within the population of genetic programming, we've got a population of 100 trees. Each tree is going to control the behavior of four lions. The most obvious way to do this is to take each tree out of the GP population, out of the genetic programming population, and clone 
that tree three times. So we have four identical copies of those trees and drop those four uh, clones into the four lions and off they go. That's the easiest thing to do. But there's other things we could do, like for example this, which is when we create a tree in the population, we actually at the root create an empty node and then create four trees below. And then we start filling in these nodes by reaching into this bag at random. What this does is it sort of simplifies our life because there's now one tree for the entire pride. The first subtree down here dictates how L1 is going to move. The second subtree dictates how L2 is going to move, and so on. What's the potential benefit of encoding the behaviors of the lions like this, then like this? Exactly, right? Here, it's kind of, it's, even with name-based sensing and dialectic sensing, it might be hard for the lions to specialize. If it does m make sense for one lion to go to be offense and the other three to be defense or flushers or whatever it is, hard maybe to evolve it, so let's evolve this. But if we have a population of trees that look like this, here's one random tree in the population, here's a second random tree in the population, here's a third random tree. Assuming by chance these three trees survived, their respective prides did relatively well at bringing down the gazelle, how do we make children from these? We could make a randomly modified copy of each we could treat these as three parents and make one child from each of these three parents. Or we could try and combine behaviors from different parents. So this is sort of an odd form of sexual recombination. We're going to create one child, one strategy for one pride that combines strategies of individual lions from the three different parental genotypes. Everybody see that? For those that, right, for those that remember NEAT, this is a little bit like the NEAT algorithm. It also inherits one of the problems, the problem that NEAT was designed to solve. Checking your short-term memory here. What was the problem NEAT was designed to solve? The data itself, you're, t you're combining clumps of data, but you're taking them out of context. Maybe L1, which is, actually, uh, which is actually donating its behavior into this pride, maybe L1 actually did do very well. Maybe L1 was actually the lion that brought down the gazelle in this parental pride, but it only did so with the support of its siblings, L2, L3, and L4, and so, the behavior for L1 has now become the behavior for L2 in this new pride, but L2 is surrounded by different, differently behaving partners. It's kind of lost that behavior. This is another form of the competing conventions problem. Comes up a lot in machine learning in general, right? We're sort of combining useful stuff into a new algorithm this algorithm over here, the behavior for the pride, but taken out of context. So the idea was kind of cool. Let's allow specialization to make it easier for specialization to evolve in this pride, but we got the competing, competing conventions problem. The investigators realized that, and they made a little bit of a tweak to this, which they called restricted breeding which is L1 could only donate behavior to another one, to an L1 in a child pride. We're still, L1, the, the new L1 is still working inside of pride with an L2 from another parent, so it's not great, but L1s donate their genetic material to other L1s, 
and L3s only donate their genetic material to L3s. So over evolutionary time, it looks like the evolution of specialization might be easier in restricted breeding compared to these two algorithm variants. So far, so good? Okay, so again, we've got a lot of moving pieces here. We have algorithm A, B, and C. And we now have three different ways of propagating genetic information from one generation to the next. We'll call these variants X, Y, and Z. We can combine these things. AX, AY, AZ, BX, BY, BZ, CX, CY, CZ, which gives us nine algorithm variants. Why would free breeding be better at specialization? Up here, it allows more specialization than cloning. So in cloning, the lions can still move differently, but very difficult for them to actually, over evolutionary time, evolve a specialized behavior, right? You can really see it in restricted breeding. You could imagine L1 over evolutionary time from child to child to child to child. L1 gets better and better and better at sneaking up on the gazelle based on what its other three partners are doing. And L2, L3, and L4 get really good at sneaking up indirectly around the gazelle. You could imagine specialization starting to evolve more easily in restricted breeding than the other two. Yeah. Okay, so we've got nine algorithm variants. For each of those nine algorithm variants, they're gonna do 100 evolutionary runs. They're gonna evolve prides of lions 100 times. They wanna see, on average, for all of the three different algorithm variants, A, B, and C, and the three different ways of constructing the prides, X, Y, and Z, on average, how well do the prides evolve to bring down the gazelle? As if that's not complicated enough, they introduced variant 10, 11, and 12. Okay, what are 10, 11, and 12? They're just simpler versions of the algorithm. These are known as the controls. These are sort of baseline how well on average can the algorithm do, and then how well do these nine algorithm variants improve on these simpler ways of doing things. Algorithm t uh, variant 10 here, just evolve one lion. As we've already seen, it's probably not gonna do very well, but let's run this, uh, this algorithm 100 times and see how well one lion evolves to bring down the gazelle. Let's. Uh, execute 100 simulations in which there's just a randomly moving lion. And let's run 100 simulations in which there are four randomly moving lions. These are the three controls. For these three controls, we're going to get back floating point numbers. How well, on average, a single evolved lion got to the gazelle, how well a single randomly moving lion got to the gazelle, and how well four randomly moving lions got to the gazelle. That's gonna give us a baseline. What does that distance actually mean? And then, do any of these nine variants evolve lions that get closer to the gazelle than this? That's why it's called a control, right? We're controlling our expectations here. How, how much better can we do? Okay, these are details, uh, details of the evolutionary algorithm. We're running short on time. I don't think we need these. Okay, apologies. That's a long lead up to the results. They don't look fancy. No fancy graphs here. We're just going to uh, look at the matrix directly. Let's look at the three controls down here. Here's the one evolved lion. On average, the uh, random lion, uh, the evolved lion gets seven length units away from the gazelle. I won't go back and show you the visualization. That's about as bad as you can do. That's the gazelle showing off. 
The gazelle is about as far from the single evolved lion as the gazelle can possibly get on the toroid. So evolving behavior for a single lion does nothing. You'll see that this number is not that different from this number. One randomly moving lion gets about as close to the gazelle as one evolved lion does. So how bad can things get? This bad, this number. We're starting to calibrate our understanding of what these length units mean on the toroid. If we put four random lions on the toroid and have them move at random, they do better. How? How can four randomly moving lions do better than one randomly moving lion? The gazelle's always moving away. They just cover more space, right? The lions, they're moving randomly, so they're spread out more or less across the toroid, so the gazelle can't help but being a little bit closer to one of them. So as long as there are four lions on the donut, we want to see whether any of our nine algorithm variants can do better than 4.41, get closer than 4.41 units away from the gazelle. Yeah? OK. Here's our 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 results from our nine algorithm variants. The immediate thing that should jump out to you about all nine numbers is they're better. So evolving behaviors for four lions using this set, this set, this set, or evolving them like this, or like this, or like this, any combination or permutation of these things does better. So we already have a conclusion to the title of the paper, which is yes, we can evolve teamwork and coordination among a group of admittedly simple robots acting together. First, uh, first conclusion from the set of results. OK. All right. Among all the nine algorithm variants here, which one did the best? Name-based restricted. OK, so let's go and look at name-based. So name-based is when the lions actually uh, modulate their behavior based on actual other lions. I'm going to do what I do based on what L2 is doing, not based on what the rightmost lion in my line of sight is doing. So evolving specialization helps, and name-based Restricted breeding, this form of breeding down here, produces the best. So again, this is an early study, no YouTube videos, I'm afraid. We can't actually see the behavior of the lions of what they're doing. But you should be able to conclude from the fact that this number is the lowest number among these set of nine numbers, generally what's going on, generally what is going on. What are the prides of lions evolving to do in this particular algorithm variant? Absolutely, right? What, however this pride is bringing down the gazelle, there is the, evolve, the evolution of specialization and, sorry, specialization and? Differentiation and coordination, right? That's the name-based sensing part. It's not one of them saying, listen, I'll go get the gazelle. The three of you just do whatever you want. I don't care. It doesn't matter, right? That's not coordination. That's not teamwork. There is specialization and coordination going on here somehow. Gazelle's pretty fast, right? The best that any lion ever did in all of these experiments was get almost there. It grazed the back hoof of the gazelle, right? These lions still go hungry. The investigators made things really hard on the lions. The gazelles travel at every time step three times faster than the lions. This is a tough task, yeah? Okay. Uh, I think we're going to leave question number three here again in the interest of time. We're a little bit behind. I'll leave this for you to think about.
So in this early study, this was basically a proof of concept about how, how you could recruit evolutionary algorithms to evolve collective behavior for autonomous machines. Hopefully, we don't want to evolve collective behavior for machines to actually do group hunting, but if you wanted to, you can. The other interesting fallout from this study was there are particular ways to evolve collective behavior for machines that are better ways than others. And interestingly, it kind of makes sense from what we see in nature. For better or for worse, for humans that are trying to coordinate the actions of eight or nine billion members, we tend to have specialization. We haven't yet figured out how to act like starlings and coordinate our behavior with no real specialization. As the starlings show us, it is possible to coordinate action, group action, with not a lot of specialization of behavior. But at least in our species, in many of insect population, uh, in many insect species, and in these virtual lion populations, evolution opts for or decides to evolve specialization, teamwork, coordination. Okay. Specialization, teamwork, coordination are great, but there's still more that you can do as a team. We've got these lions running around, and they're looking at what L1, L2, and L3 are doing. That's coordination. But they still went hungry. What else could we give the lions that would give them a little bit of an edge, that would facilitate their ability to evolve coordinated action? Communication, right? Humans can do a lot. When you're doing a group sport, you're usually running and you're out of breath. You don't have the ability to actually communicate. We do a lot of this implicit coordination. I infer what my teammates are about to do based on what they're currently doing, based on my memory of what they've done before. But even though I'm out of breath, often you'll see pro athletes signaling to each other as they're working, right? There's a real strong pressure if you want to coordinate complex actions in a large group to explicitly communicate information. We only have two minutes left, so I'm just going to introduce the second study, the second study in our study of collective robotics, in which we're again going to look at an evolutionary algorithm that evolves, uh, that evolves cooperative action in a group, but also allows the individuals to evolve communication and possibly verging on language. Let's see. OK. We're doing things not chronologically uh, at the moment. We're going even further back in time to 1991. This is a very, very old study. I love it. It's a classic. OK. The evolution, the title says it all, the evolution of communication. We're back to pre-physics engine uh, world, so uh, uh, worlds. So again, we're going to look at a donut. This is a discrete donut. So we've got a donut, and it's divided up with grid paper. So we've got a whole bunch of unique grid points. We've got a total of 200 by 200 or 40,000 empty squares on this toroid. And instead of four lions, in this case, we're going to have 1,600 agents. And at the beginning of every simulation that you see here, we're going to drop these 1,600 agents into some of these empty squares. And a new twist on an evolutionary robotics experiment, actually an old twist, but for us, new that we haven't seen before, these individuals are gendered. 800 female agents, 800 male agents. They have different abilities to sense, think, and act. We'll leave things there for now. You have a quiz due tonight. You're working, uh, you're gonna start working on your third weekly report. See you all on Thursday. Thanks.